Joel, just uh, bear with me for one little moment here. Susie, this is that moment where I told you about, so you need to prepare yourself for it. Okay, everybody sit still. Give me a smile. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. What I do is I run that through facial recognition, and it goes through the post office to see who's... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Look, looking, we're looking for uh, updated church directory photos. Um, share with you just a little bit about my uh, sermon series so far. I'm a huge Disney fan, and I've been to Disney World a number of times. I've been to Disneyland a number of times. But uh, after about my second visit to Disney... I had started to see that they do things a little bit differently than many other companies. Uh, I grew up going to Six Flags in Arlington. I'd been to Frontier City in Oklahoma City. I'd been to other amusement parks. But Disney was somehow different. And so I began an in-depth study of them as a company and them, you know, the way they do things and how they handle, you know, their broad approach to impacting people who come into their uh, world, you may say you may call it that. And so I started looking at how they did things and, and started to ask the question, why can't we as the church have as big an impact on people as Disney does? And so that led me into studying what the church does and how we could bring things from Disney into the church so that we might try to be more intentional about making an impact into people's lives. I've shared so far about how um, everyone is a very important individual person and that we need to treat everyone as somebody who has their own needs, who has their own wants, who comes with their own um, stereotypes and their own emotions and their own expectations into the church. And we need to kind of meet those and exceed those if we really want to make something more of a church experience. I talked about how we have to see the greatest in the kingdom of God. And really, the greatest in the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, is the one who has the most needs. Because the one who has the most needs, if we are doing what Jesus has called us to do, we actually humble ourselves in front of that person and we raise them up above ourselves. And then, of course, last week I shared with you that, you know, we are not the, um, we are not this people who, who are, uh, you know what, I forgot my sermon last week. Any of y'all remember my sermon last week? Yeah, I throw these quizzes in on y'all sometimes. There's a reason for that. What, Les? Special people. What about special people? We're all special to God. But what about the special people? We all have the same job. There is no one leader in the church. We share in the responsibility of doing the mission and the ministry of the church. All of us are gifted. All of us are empowered. And we're all a part of doing things to make a difference. Now these are all the people emphasis sermons that I have. Now I'm going to be looking at some other things. But I don't want you to ever forget that people is our business. We are in a people business as Disney is in a people business. Today I want to share with you story. Story is one of my favorite things that Disney does well. In fact, they probably exceed everybody else in the industry when it comes to story. In fact, if I talk about Disney, stories are going to be what come to your mind. Usually a movie or a TV show or maybe even a story of going to a Disney park with your family. But I want to go to this story from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 4. Now Jesus had come to Nazareth. What's special about Nazareth and Jesus? That's his hometown. That's where he grew up. All right? So he had come to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And everyone spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. In truth, I tell you, there, are many, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. None of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and they drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the hill. But passing through their midst, he went away. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? God, in your great and bountiful grace, you sent forth your son to, to bring stories to people told them stories by reminding them of the words of the covenant, bringing to mind a fresh reading of the law, telling them of the prophets and what the prophets had said, sharing with them parables that had a point, stories that, that pointed them in a direction that they could go if only they could understand. But most of all, he came to continue the story you had begun. That your great love for this world, which began before the creation, was being now fulfilled right there in their midst. And that that story had not had a happy ending written yet. And so he came to provide a little more to it. We know how that story ends. The story has still not ended because we are a part of it. And we continue to tell it and live it each and every day of our life. So help us to live into that story that you have begun, that you revealed in Christ, and that you made real within us, that we may share it with others. In this message, may my words be yours, that I would speak wisdom and truth according to your will and your word. And may our hearts and minds be filled with your presence your glory, your love, your wisdom, that we may share all of these with a world who desperately needs to hear them. I pray these things in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Kelly, go ahead and roll that film clip. I want to share with you a little clip. During the last few years, we've ventured into a lot of different fields, and we've had the opportunity to meet and work with a lot of wonderful people. I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a mouse. That's a very famous saying around Walt Disney World and, and Disneyland and the Walt Disney Company even today, that everything was started by a mouse. Now, if you, do the, if you know the history of Walt Disney, you know that's not true. In fact, the story of Mickey Mouse is Walt Disney's third attempt to start something. He failed twice before he got a story that he could work with. And that story began with a mouse. In fact, this year in November, Mickey Mouse celebrates his 90th birthday. For 90 years, the story that Walt Disney has told began with this little bitty mouse. Do you remember what that story was that began everything? Steamboat Willie. And here's the interesting thing about Steamboat Willie. It was the first cartoon with sound. At that time, talkies, as they were called, motion pictures with sound 
were very rare. That Walt Disney would do something crazy like put a few minutes of line-drawn animation with sound up on a screen was ridiculous. It was absurd. And 90 years later, we're celebrating that mouse's birthday. See, Walt was a storyteller. Walt loved to be able to get people and entertain them. That was his big thing. Now, there was another idea that he came up with that was quite ridiculous. In fact, it has become known as Walt's Folly because that's what it was called when it was first conceived and brought to the public. People thought, you're crazy. You've lost your mind. You're going to send yourself into destitution by doing this. But Walt had an idea, but he had to get people sold on the idea of a feature-length, full-color animated movie. The very first feature-length, full-color animated movie was Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. No one had ever thought of doing that before. And Walt had this idea. Let's do it. We have to have the right story, though. And so Walt went around, and he would tell people the story. But really, it came down to convincing the people in his own company that he had to do it. So this is what he did. One day, he went around to a group of people in his office, and he gave them some money, and he says, I want you to go across the street, I want you to buy yourself some supper, and then I want you to come back and meet me in the soundstage tonight. I want to show you something. So that's what the animators and the people around the office did. They went across the street, they bought themselves something, they came back, they get into this soundstage, and there's about 50 of them in this great big room that is completely dark except for one spotlight on the stage. And in that spotlight steps... Walt Disney. Will you guys go ahead and put those pictures up if you can? Walt begins to tell the story of Snow White. Now here's the thing. This is not the pure Brothers Grimm version of Snow White. This is Walt's version of Snow White. The story that he's been building in his head. The story that he's been visioning that he wants to tell. And as he goes through the story, Walt Disney in front of these 50 men who all work for him, Walt Disney becomes Snow White. Walt Disney becomes the evil queen. He becomes the huntsman. He becomes all of the dwarves. He becomes the prince at the end of the story. He loved to tell that story. And people walked out of that room and they said, if this movie does even a fraction as good a job as Walt did in telling that story, it will be a huge success. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves went on to be one of film's greatest historical moments. Even today, people look back on it and they see it as something revolutionary to its time, and to the world of media. But it had to do with this guy. Next slide, please. Can't see it very well, but he's got his pe cheeks all puffed out. That's not the Walt we're used to seeing. We're used to seeing the Walt with a suit, right? Uncle Walt that was on the Disneyland program, or Walt Disney Presents. This is Walt as the storyteller. He loved to tell stories. And when he came up with the idea of Disneyland, he says everything has to tell a story. Everything in Disneyland needs to tell the story. How many of you have ever been to Disneyland or Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom? Okay, so a lot of you have been there. You know that whenever you go into Disneyland or Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom, there are different lands. There's Adventureland and Frontierland and Fantasyland and Tomorrowland. There's all of these different lands that you can go into. I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but when you go into Walt Disney World and you go from, from a land to a land, everything is telling a story, including the cast members. They have individual costumes based on where they work. Meaning that if somebody's in Adventureland, it's usually something khaki and it looks like somebody who's a, a safari guide. 
Over in Tomorrowland, it's usually a shiny gray or futuristic-looking fabric. In Fantasyland, it's very bright colors, and, and it seems to draw the attention. But more important than that, if you go to an attraction within a land, many of those cast members have their own costume to wear to fit the story of the attraction. One of the things that is more important than story for the Disney company is safety. And even all of their safety stuff has to match the story. If you've ever seen a cruise ship in modern times, you know that they have very visible lifeboats. In fact, cruise ships have to have lifeboats that match certain standards from the Coast Guard. They have to be a certain color. Usually it's blazing orange so it can be seen at sea. The Walt Disney Company, when it came up with its own cruise ships, they went to the Coast Guard, and they said, we don't like orange. We want Mickey yellow. Why? Because if you look at the Disney cruise ships, they are painted Mickey Mouse colors. They got permission to change their lifeboats to Mickey Mouse yellow to fit their story. When you're walking through the Magic Kingdom, one of my favorite places to walk is in Adventureland. You go through Adventureland, and, and the interesting thing is, is that when you get to the magic carpets of Aladdin, you walk into this, this section of the park, and it looks a little different. It looks like you're in Morocco or, or Tunisia or somewhere in the, in the Middle East. But when you look down at the pavement, there are bits of pottery and jewelry that are broken like treasures embedded in the pavement. Or if you walk over into the area in front of the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse, the pavement is more of an earth tone. If you walk over into Frontierland, it looks almost wood-like. Even the sidewalks tell stories. Then there's the architecture. Buildings are not just buildings in Disney World. Storytelling takes place everywhere that you go. In fact, if you go through Frontierland, there's a specific story that it tells. You begin at one place, and you go to another place, and you are either moving forward or backward through time because the buildings are dated in their architecture. I thought about this stuff. It's weird how in-depth they went with this. Storytelling takes place in and through and around everything that Disney does. And when Disney loses sight of the story they're trying to tell, that's when things go sideways. That's when they have problems. Everything tells the story. There are only two things that are more important than telling the story in the Disney company. The first is safety. The second is courtesy. Haunted Mansion one of our favorite attractions. When you get to the Haunted Mansion, the cast members are not dressed like anybody else. They're dressed in muted grays and blacks. And they look very somber in their appearance. In fact, it's a big joke if you can get a cast member to break character. Because it looks like this all the time. Because it's a Haunted Mansion. And you proceed through the queue, the line. And you're going up the walk to the Haunted Mansion like one of those old plantation-style houses. And there are gardens that are unkept. There's a cemetery that has different mementos and monuments within it. And then you get up to the doors, and they open the doors, and you walk into this grand house. And all of it is show. All of it is telling you a story to get in. And when you get into the main part of the attraction... It is a constant moving attraction, which means the cars never stop. They are always moving so they can get people through. The only time you know they're going to stop is when a guest with mobility issues comes along. If somebody can't keep up with the movement of the carts, they stop everything for safety and courtesy to make sure that that person can get on that attraction so that they can experience it. Only two things come before story, safety and courtesy. Everything else has to tell a story. Jesus 
knew what his story was. This day he shows up in Nazareth, his hometown. He comes home one day and he goes to church. And just because people have heard that he's been doing some stuff around the region, they thought, you know what, it might be cool if Jesus reads for us this day. So Jesus gets the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he reads this passage of scripture. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, he takes the scroll, he rolls it up, he hands it back to the attendant, and he says to everybody, today the prophet has been fulfilled. Today the words that you are listening to have been fulfilled fulfilled what he was saying is is that when he read the spirit of the lord is upon me to do these things he was literally saying the spirit of the lord is upon me to do these things jesus says this is my story this is who i am which is why we get this encounter after he gives the scroll away and people say hey ain't that joseph's boy He's a carpenter, right? That's what he knows what to do. What is he talking about this stuff that he came to do this Lord thing? And then they said, you know what? In their minds they were saying, I wonder if he's going to show us any of the cool stuff that he's been doing around the region. I wonder if he's going to heal anybody. I wonder if he's going to cast any demons out. I wonder if he's going to do a miracle for us. And Jesus, it seems, knows their heart. And he says, look, I ain't here for you. Imagine a hometown boy coming back and saying, you know what? I'm not here for you. I'm not here to, to take care of your needs. I'm not here to, to, to deal with your wishes. I've got a bigger duty. I've got a bigger responsibility. Jesus saying, this is my story. I am here to see that the Lord's job is done. That those who are captives can be brought free that the poor can hear good news that the blind can see and guess what the next three chapters in the book of luke tell us exactly the story jesus is living it talks about the the sick being healed it talks about the lame being cured it talks about demons being cast out it talks about the good news that he proclaims throughout his ministry from chapter 4 verse 31 through chapter 7 verse 50 we hear about him doing all of these things to live the story that he said he was there for ultimately his full ministry tells this same story his life is about bringing good news to everyone who is poor in spirit who is destitute of spirit who has lost everything and has no hope in anything Jesus has brought liberty to the world so that we are not held captive by sin and death. Jesus brings sight to those who believe. The eyes of faith are open to experience the vision of God. Those who are oppressed are released into an abundant and free life. And the Lord's Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor, a year of living under God's gracious mercy, begins for those who surrender their lives to Christ. Jesus came to tell this story. And now you're a part of it. You're here today, and you're a part of the story. You're a part of God's story that he, Jesus, told us about. From the very beginning of creation, God has been working on a story, and now we're all a part of it. Everyone sitting here. Now, you have your own stories, right? You all came from somewhere. You came from someone. You've done stuff, had stuff done to you. We all got stories. I know this because I hear you all tell them all the time. We all have our own stories. This church has its own story. I've been hearing some of the stories as I've been getting to know you all. The church, the big church, the tradition 
is the story of, of the people of the faith going all the way back to the time of Jesus. There is also the big story, the story that Jesus Christ took flesh, came into the world, became one of us so that God could do something earth-shatteringly magnificent. We are a part of that story. Yes, you're a part of your own story. Yes, you're a part of this church's story. Yes, you're a part of the tradition story. But you are a part of God's story. You're here today. That's proof of that. You've got to grasp hold on to it. You've got to take hold of the fact that you're a part of that story. But what's your part? What part do you play in that story? Because every one of us has a part to play. What is your story in God's story? We are now God's storytellers. We are now here to continue to share with others the story of what God has been doing. So how do we share our story in word or in deed? How do we tell others that we are actually a part of what God has been doing since before the foundation of the world? How do we convince others that this story is our story? Do they see us live it out? Do we look like this when we live out the story of God in our lives? Is it something that animates us? Is it something that moves us? How do people know our story and how do they know we believe our own story? Are we telling a true story? Some of us like the fairy tales we've created. Some of us like the fables that we've inserted into our story. I want to tell you the truth. When you try to tell someone else a fantasy or a fairy tale about our lives, they know it. They know it. They know when we see they know when they see it on us that the story that we're telling is not true. They know that the story that we're trying to convince them of is as much a fable to us as it is to them. We have to have a true story. We have to live a true story. And we have to tell that true story because we are continuing what Jesus did. There were a lot of people who wanted to change Jesus' story. Did you know that? The Nazarenes, the Nazarite people, the people that lived in Nazareth, they said, you're just Joseph's son. You're just a carpenter. Jesus says, I have to go to Jerusalem and be sacrificed. And Peter says, no, God, no, we don't need you to do that. Judas wanted Jesus to do something and tried to manipulate him. Satan wanted to change his story, but he never changed it. Now that we've been exposed to that story, how are we making it our story? How are we telling others? How are we helping them believe that this is a true story? When we lose sight of the story, when we lose sight of Christ's story, when we lose sight...